media speculation. All the experts agree. John McEnroe is so confident. The football player is not quite the Prime Minister of the country, is it? Yeah, good question. From the coach's box to pit lane, this is The Ticket. The ticket. Hello, welcome to a special edition of The Ticket on ABC News 24 and ABC News Radio. I'm Tracy Holmes. This year we've seen a huge shift in women's sport that goes further than gold medals, world titles and breakthrough performances. We're witnessing a change in cultural norms, a change that has seen the creation of two new fully professional women's competitions, where female athletes can stand as equals alongside their male counterparts, where they're recognised and, in some cases, suitably compensated for their professionalism, and where women's sport is increasingly prominent in media coverage, with more play-by-play broadcasts than ever before. Australian know-how is also making an impact in the Asia-Pacific region, as we're about to learn. Joining me on today's panel to discuss celebrating women's sport with a pivot to the Asia-Pacific is Australia's Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop. Nice to have you, Minister. Thank you, Tracy. Olympic gold medalist, Australian rugby sevens player, Elia Green. Good to have you, Elia. Thanks, Tracy. And Olympian and Australia's first Indigenous player to represent her sport at the Olympics, beach volleyball player, Taliqua Clancy. Thanks for coming in, Taliqua. Thank you. Minister, I'm going to start with you. Two of the world's most powerful countries are China and Russia. They've used the Olympic Games as part of their soft power program over the last few years. How difficult is it to get the balance right between using sport as an agent for positive change and it becoming a political tool? Well, Tracy, sport and politics have always been intertwined and we've seen some of the great political battles globally played out at the Olympic Games in the past. But in Australia, we use sport as a positive tool for international engagement, particularly in the Asia Pacific. And it's a fundamental part of what we call sports diplomacy. And in the case of the Pacific, we have a number of sporting programs that empower people, provide them with skills, life skills, um, provide opportunities for healthier lifestyles, and also build resilient communities. So it's a fundamental part of our overseas development assistance to use sport to build bridges and also to see better health and lifestyle outcomes in the countries where we deliver that support. But also our partnership with the ABC, Women in News and Sport, to provide economic opportunities for women to take part in sports administration, sports journalism and the like. It's a fundamental part of our foreign policy. OK, we'll come back and talk a little more about that program later on. But there was a study that was done in 2015 where the academics looked at uh, the gender gap in various countries and gender equality and how that transferred to winning medals at big events like the Olympic Games. And obviously, no surprise, those that had a much narrower gap performed much better. Having said that, we are one of those countries, but why do you think it's taken so long to achieve gender equity in sport, which we're still not quite there. We're a long way further ahead than we have been, but there's still some way to go. In fact, we're learning these lessons about gender equality across the board. In economic terms, companies that have a high representation of women on boards are shown to have better profit and loss outcomes. They're more profitable companies as a result. It's taken us a while to see the link, the connection. And I think the survey to which you referred is indicative of how gender equality can promote better outcomes across the board. So sport, yes, it has been slow in realising that, but now we're seeing the success of women's leagues, women's sporting teams, um, not only domestically here in Australia, in our region and internationally. And the more women who are on um, governing bodies for sporting organisations, the more women who are involved in sporting clubs, the more women and girls who play sport, um, the better the outcomes for that particular country. Elia, you won the first Olympic gold medal with your teammates, of course, in rugby sevens. But before you got to Rio, you competed on the world tour. You compete in places like Hong Kong, Dubai. How is women's sport treated there? And do you notice a difference in, in the crowds or the level of support or the media coverage that you get in some of these other countries? 
Look, definitely, Tracy. Um, we, when we perform on the circuit with the men, such as Hong Kong, Dubai, um, London, and soon to be the Sydney Sevens, obviously the crowds are just like double the size of what it'd be if it was just a women's IRB World Series, um, which just shows, you know, um, people want to see um, both. But, you know, we hope just in the future that it will be just as big crowds just for the women as well because, you know, we provide the entertainment, we hit just as hard, run just as fast. It's an entertaining game to watch and we can also win a gold medal for Australia. So I hope it's just going to grow with the viewers and spectators, not just in Australia but around the world. Now, what about Fiji? They won the men's gold medal in Rio. Yep. Have they got much of an investment program happening with the women's competition as well? Will Fiji one day rival Australia for that gold medal? I hope so. You know, my country of birth and I'm a Fiji girl at heart but I'm an Aussie girl and I'm... Also, I um, have a lot of pride playing for my country. I'm really proud to be part of both cultures. And, you know, I've been given this amazing opportunity to play for Australia. And you know, I just hope that, you know, um, young girls growing up in the islands can be given the same opportunities as what I have because they are so naturally talented. And, um, you know, they deserve, deserve all, of, all of it as well. Taliqua, let's talk about beach volleyball for a moment. You got to the quarterfinals there, just one match out of the medals. It was close. It was a breakthrough performance on perhaps the best venue in Rio, Copacabana Beach. But again, before you got there, you'd competed in Germany, uh, in Moscow, several other countries. What do you get from travelling the world? How has it made you see the world we live in differently through the opportunity sports given you? It's very similar to Aaliyah. Um, we have a world tour circuit and just the response and the media overseas is very different to what we would get here in Australia. The questions that we would be asked, the way that we are treated is extremely different and you can see the gaps that we're talking about today that it is a bit behind and we're not completely equal because in my sport, because we do run around and play in bikinis, it always seems to be the Australian media, media who love to bring, that up, to bring that up, not just to talk about what we've done on the court and our, our performance. It always seems to always draw back on the physical look and look of our sport. So that's interesting. You're saying that happens here more so than in other countries and yet we would hold ourselves up as, you know, we are one of the best and the most gender equal and we're not hung up on those sorts of issues. Yeah, definitely. I think also um, volleyball is a lot bigger and a well-known sport overseas but um, not as well known in Australia and I think maybe that's where the gap is with the response from the media. Minister, we saw in Rio that the International Olympic Committee didn't ban the entire Russian team, only the track and field athletes, but the Paralympic Committee did. I wonder whether you see it as um, an OK situation that, that athletes are used in what could be perceived as an ideological, political battle between nations and, and great governing bodies. Should athletes be put in that position? In an ideal world, no, of course not. They are there as athletes and um, providing the entertainment, the role models, the um, upholding of the wonderful spirit of, for example, the Olympics. But I'm afraid it's inevitable that sport and politics do become entwined. And I hope that in the case of the um, drug issue, that the higher standards are set and that we don't compromise for political or other reasons. And that's what will underpin global sport, international sport, and here in Australia. We have to have the highest possible standards. And it is a lot of pressure on our athletes. They are role models, whether they want to be or not. And we need to provide them with the support, with clear rules, with high standards, and support for them as our elite athletes. And I think the Australian teams, when they perform on the world stage, certainly do us proud. Well, of course, women have been playing sport for as long as men have been, but the real difference has been the recognition and support that each gender receives. Isn't it time those who tell the stories of women's sport are also agents of change? Let's do away with the gender stereotypes and questions that have nothing to do with women's sporting prowess. Just imagine the response if male athletes were described in the way women are, or if men were asked some of the questions female athletes often are. You're getting a lot of fans here, a lot of them are female, and they want to know if you could date anyone in the world, who would you date? Any 
response to recent comments about your girlish figure? Are you serious? Removing your body hair gives you an edge in the pool. How about your love life? How has your weight gain affected your mobility? I don't know what I don't know what Have you heard the controversy over your helmet hair? <laughs> Get ready to see some great biceps, tiny tanks, and more. I wonder if his dad said to him when he was younger, listen, you're never going to be a looker, you're never going to be a Beckham, so you'll have to compensate for that. He really does have the kind of body international judges love. Could you give us a twirl and tell us about your outfit? What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? It's interesting, isn't it? And I suppose one of the people that does address this on a regular basis is Serena Williams, you know, and she's quite famous for calling it out when it happens. Like, what's that got to do with anything? Have either of you found yourselves in that situation? Mm, yes and yeah. no. Or yes. Yeah. I generally <laughs> brush it off. I should probably start doing what Serena does and address the <laughs> yeah. issue. Yeah. What about you, Elia? Well, I guess being in a like a male-dominated sport previously, you get asked questions that you think you know you think twice. Would you ask that to a male? Probably not. You know about the about the. I've been asked. You know, oh, do you um do you guys tackle as well? Do you girls actually tackle? And I'm like, yeah. yeah. At yeah. least watch the sport we before we you come do. and do an interview yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. Or you know, just ask like, how do you balance, um, you know, being a being a mum and because for some we have a mum in our um, squad, and they ask her how do you balance being a mum and playing sport? Well, would you ask a male how do you balance being a dad and playing rugby too? It's just questions like that, which you know are fair enough. Some people would like to know that, but are asked so much more commonly to females, other than males and. Yeah, you do question yourself. And I imagine it's not just sport, is it, Minister? I imagine you've confronted fairly similar situations. One of the most often asked questions is, what's it like being a woman in politics? And I always say, I don't know, I've never been a man in politics. How am I going to compare? It is what it is. Uh, but I tend to brush it off. I accept the fact that people are interested in the still novel aspect of being a woman in a male-dominated professional career or sport and you, you brush it off but I think over time as we see more women entering politics as we see more uh, top teams being female more elite female athletes more women's leagues it won't have that curiosity novelty value anymore and it will just be the norm. There are a number of female ministers now foreign ministers around the world you had a get together with some fairly recently what's the discussion about it when, very, when you all get together? It was very interesting. It was in New York during the United Nations General Assembly Leaders Week and that morning I had attended a meeting of 26 foreign ministers and I was the only female. It was on Syria and Iraq. It was a very serious high-level meeting but there were 25 foreign ministers who were male and me. That night, as it happened, 26 female foreign ministers got together for dinner and we spoke about the same topics, the same issues, but the content, the uh, composition of the conversation was completely different. The contrast could not have been greater. And I was privileged to be at both events. But women are so much more um, prepared to exchange ideas, prepared to give each other credit, uh, to uh, be prepared to look at a whole raft of different ways of tackling a problem. The contrast was incredible. Yeah, I imagine so. Back in the 90s, women's sport was mostly left to female reporters. Now we see women covering top men's sport and men covering top women's sport. I spoke with Warren Partland, a senior male sports journalist covering women's sport, and asked him how, in an AFL mad city, he first came to cover netball. Ago, uh, a young lass called Tanya Denver at the time was a colleague, and she was a very much a pioneer of women's sport coverage in this country, not just Adelaide. And she was very much pushing netball and demanding that it got space. She got promoted in the company at the Advertiser in Adelaide here, and she pushed for me to do the job. I didn't get it straight away. Another lady got it, but she left the company within about six months, and they got and Tanya pushed for me to do it, and and I've been doing it ever since. In the beginning, did you struggle to cover women's sport in the same way that you covered men's sport? I uh, know. Because of what Tanya created back in those days, netball's always had a good coverage and they expect a story on the Thunderbirds, the Adelaide Thunderbirds, they expect a story on the Thunderbirds during season every day. 
So I have no problem, no issue. We have columns, um, we have features, we have good reads and a lot of column space on the Thunderbirds is no issue. The boss actually demands it from me. What about your male colleagues? Did they ever joke with you about covering netball? I, never. I've never had, in all the years I've been doing it, I don't think I've had one comment from internally in, in the office. Because the paper, the advertiser, treats netball and women's sport with great respect, um, and it's treated as a mainstream sport as such, um, no, they, I, I'm just treated like anyone else. And I could be covering football, netball or whatever. I've never copped any criticism inside. I probably, or any comments or ribbing, uh, more so from people probably when I do my football coverage and, and they say, well, why don't you go back to uh, Netball Partland and just stay there? That's the only time I really cop any, cover, uh, any sort of ribbing. And do you think we've reached the day where it's just about sports reporters covering sport rather than male or female reporters covering male or female sport? Oh, I think it obviously depends on the individual's sort of mindset that I know when I go to a netball game, I, I look at um, 14 players on a court and they could be female, male or indifferent. I, I don't care who they are. I just report on them as athletes. And I know from my point of view, it, it, I treat them very much like a male. I've been privileged in most of my time to be working with a coach called Jane Woodlands Thompson. And she, one of her, probably her issues she had with netball was that it wasn't moving professional enough and it wasn't moving and it had to be, had to be given the same respect as men. And so she would tell her players, if you're gonna get good uh, publicity from Warren, you're also going to get criticised. And I can tell you, I treated that uh, netball and I treat netball as if it is, it's a male sport, doesn't matter if I'm at a football game or a netball game, I write about it, I criticise it. As for where are we going with it, now that women's football's come into it, I think they'll get more coverage. I think people have gotten what this um, stereotype women's sort of sport these days has gone. I think these days it's respected a lot more and they are understood as athletes. I mean, some of the women athletes that I deal with, they, they work as hard and they are as fit as men uh, without any doubt. And I, I think it's getting to that stage now where, where um, it's still a long way to go. I mean, you look at women fought to get into men's football change rooms. Well, there's no way in the world you could go into a women's change room. Not that I've got any desire to go in there, but there's still a lot of way to go. For I think if women want to be treated and get coverage like men and be treated like men, they still have to take a few steps to being treated, uh, acting like professionals themselves. Um, they still struggle with a little bit, I believe, with criticism. And I think it's up to the sports themselves, even netball, to, if you want to be treated like men and you, you are actually asking that way, then you have to expect the same sort of coverage as men. That includes, includes criticism. But I, I think, um, I, I, no, I definitely think we'll get there because the days of treating women uh, like they stay in the kitchen and all this sort of stuff as wives, no, they're gone. I, I, I believe they're treated now with a lot more respect and, and as they should be. And what sort of impact do you think the new competitions in AFL and netball are going to have on the grassroots competition for young girls that are coming through and aspiring to be athletes? I think there is a genuine concern, if, if I can say this, from the Olympic sports in that... Um, with the men, the men have so many more choices, like football and that to be high profile. And that, so the women athletes at the Olympic Games are more successful than the men. Now that women can go into uh, football and their choices are becoming broader, that means that could affect the number of athletes staying in the traditional Olympic sports. So our number, our success at the Olympics from the women's side of view, which has been better than the men, it could be um, hampered, but as for, Opening up football opens up a lot of opportunities. You imagine how many girls are out there in the, in the lounge room and go to games. And there's, a, there's millions in this country that go to um, NRL games, go to uh, rugby union games, go to AFL games, who would love to play. They'd love to be like their heroes. And um, that, I think it's going to have a massive, massive effect on women's sport. Just gives them more opportunity to get out there and, and be on the field. Warren Partland there, a groundbreaker in the same way women reporters have been in breaking into men's sport. Now, a bit of controversy there with some of the things Warren was saying. I don't think anyone on the panel today wants to be treated like a man. I think they want to be treated as a professional in their chosen career path. Is that right? Am I reading it correctly? I thought that Minister, was an interesting um, point that he was trying to make, that if women want to be treated like men, no, I would suggest women athletes want to be treated like athletes. Women politicians want to be treated as a politician. I don't want to be a man. I want to be treated um, for what I am and what I achieve. Taliqua, do you find that odd as well, being the first Indigenous player to represent Australia in beach volleyball? 
and constantly having the Indigenous tag, rather than being... When people describe you as a role model, it's for women and the Indigenous community. Aren't you, in fact, a role model for anyone that wants to play the sport? Well, I hope I can be a role model for anyone. Um, I find it really odd that, even just listening to what he was saying, it's like if they want to be treated professionally, they have to create... that. Like, it was a separation between men and women, and I just don't understand that. So what do we have to do to show that we are professional as well if it is seen different to men it just that does it doesn't really make sense to me I don't think it's fair to pigeonhole anybody because we're all human beings and you know we all are great and special in different ways and I feel like it's really just rude to kind of pigeonhole some or anybody really. Elia you see yourself as a role model for everybody? Look, I hope so. Um, now having Rugby Sevens growing so fast worldwide, um, I just hope that the younger generation will look after us and be like, look, I want to be a rugby player. Uh, or, you know, one of our captains is a um, mechanic as well. I want to be a mechanic. I want to be a builder. A girl, like a woman can do anything and there shouldn't be any boundaries to that. And, you know, also being Fijian, um, we obviously have a very big um, Pacific culture and Pacific Islanders in um in Australia, I hope that I can also be a role model to them as well. But um, yeah, definitely, I uh, shouldn't be a stereotype in in male or female dominated. It's sport. It's rugby. I want to be treated as a female. Uh, as sorry, as a rugby player, not as a female rugby player. So, Minister, tell us more about the program that is um, operating under DFAT, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and those sorts of gender stereotypes that you're trying to break down. We have a sporting development program within our aid budget and it's specifically directed to our relationship with Pacific Island nations and we use sport as a means of um, promoting uh, team building uh, skills within individuals, building communities and that underpins more resilient nations. So we spend money on um, clinics, getting boys and girls involved in sports at the grassroots level. We support administration um, so that we can grow a generation of sports administrators so that the games can continue and we also use it as a means of um, empowering people and healthy lifestyles. Uh, there are problems with the paradox of course is malnutrition or obesity in some countries and it comes down to um, healthy choices where well, we use um, sport as another means of encouraging people to eat well and lead healthy lifestyles and reduce the cost of treating um, disease in the Pacific. So sport has been a, a wonderful means of empowering whole communities and in the last 12 months um, with an investment of $7 million in our sports in development programs. We have reached 350,000 um, men, women, girls and boys in nine Pacific Island countries through 12 of our sporting organisations here in Australia. And of that 350,000, almost half were women, were female, and about 3,000 were people with disabilities. So it really is a magnificent way of touching the lives in a positive way of so many people in our neighbourhood. So sport once again showing how it truly is the international language. It crosses all barriers and all boundaries, doesn't it? I know there's a lot of work that happens inside refugee camps as well, but we'll have to leave that for another discussion on another day. I just want to finish by asking each of you what it was about sport that first inspired you. Do you remember your first inspirational moment with sport as a young person? And did you ever think that you were going to end up being where you are now? I'll start with you, Elia. So um, I obviously was born in Fiji and um, but raised in Australia. And I started running when I was um, in kindergarten. You know, my mum came to watch me run and um, I just couldn't wait to uh, to run that race and I couldn't wait to have my mum there watching me and I'd be waving I'd be like mum you watching and I'd be waving to her and you know just the, the, the excitement of it but then however coming into rugby sevens the team environment and the values that I've learned from being a rugby player um, has taught me so many things not just 
in in the team, like on the field, but off the field as well. You know how important communication is to respect each other, being accountable for what you do on and off the field. You know, um, and to be a professional at what we do. It's taught me so many um, values. So I'd say the most um, the most that sport has done for me is that taught me uh, life values on and off the field. And yeah, it's given me this great opportunity to get the get the gold medal with my teammates. Did you ever imagine country. you'd be an Olympic gold medalist? To be honest, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, was written okay. on, it was on my wall. It was, it was something that was written in, in like on my wall since I was a very young age. Yeah. My mum, my mum believed in me since I was, um, you know, very young as well. And she said, you know, Ellie, you can do anything if you if you just um, if you stay determined and and keep dreaming big and never stop to achieve it. Taliqua? Uh, to be honest, most of it is actually the exact same as Aaliyah. Um, I was always loved sport. I played every sport that you can do. I did soccer, touch football, everything. Um, and I remember Sydney Olympics and that's when I know the Olympic dream came alive for me and I always wanted to play. Uh, being from the country, I would have not have thought that beach volleyball would have been the sport that I'd play and I get to travel the world. It's absolutely amazing. And one thing that I have truly learnt from sport and which I love about sport is that you can give back and I have the opportunity now to go out to communities and help other Aboriginal kids and encourage them and help people chase their dreams and that's just one massive love or oh, that's why I love sport so much it just brings everyone together. And Minister as I was sitting here I recalled a very early memory as a little girl and my older sister was playing in a local netball team in the Adelaide Hills. And mum drove her to the game and I went along as the little sister. And when they got there, um, my sister's team found that they were one person short and they were all so disappointed that they wouldn't be able to go on the field. Mum borrowed a netball uniform and went out on the court and played <laughs> and I was gobsmacked. I'd never seen my mother in a netball <laughs> uniform, let alone play. And it's a memory that's obviously stayed with me. I took up netball. I played it throughout school, university and beyond, long after I should have given it away. And I've just loved sport from the very earliest age, playing it, watching it, being part of it. And likewise, the Sydney Olympics was a, a big moment in all our lives. So sport is so fundamental to who we are as a country. And as foreign minister, I certainly use Australia's sporting prowess to advance our national interest. Well, it's been fabulous talking sport with you all today. Thank you for joining me, Elia Green, Taliqua Clancy and Minister Julie Bishop. Go!